Okay, right, well, welcome, everybody, to uh, March meeting. Uh, perhaps before I start, perhaps I'd just a trailer for our April meeting, which is on the 21st of April. And uh, that's a lady called Sean Reddy, who is co-founder of Fuji Molecule. And the title of her talk is Just a Kids Game, Think Again. Uh, I think she'll be talking about diversity and skills in the gaming industry, so that uh, could be quite interesting. She was um, on Woman's Hour. And she was on Woman's Hour, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's going to be fun. Oh, oh visit their website. <laughs> 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 right. So, moving on to tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Grant Blunt from the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, Grant is the Survey Research Fellow at uh, the Institute, who studies the social and cultural impact of the internet. So it would be uh, interesting to uh, see where we've come from and where we're going. So I'll hand over to Thank you, Grant. Thank you all for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here to speak to uh, the British Computer Society. And so, um, I'm going to talk about some issues relating to the cultures of the internet and cultural activity on the internet. Um, this is some research which you'll see is based on some survey data we've been collecting um, at the Internet Institute, and I'll talk a little bit about the data as well. Um, what I'm going to do here is highlight what I think is a major change in perspective on what it is that drives internet use. And I mean internet use very broadly, not just in terms of the, um, whether or not someone uses the internet, although I mean that as well, but also what they do on the internet, how much activity they do on the internet, the variety of activity they do on the internet. So let's begin with a little bit of perspective here on the digital divide. Um, the digital divide classically, of course, means the difference between um, people who used the internet and didn't. And in fact, the early research on the internet focused on that issue, on simple access. Could people get on the internet or not? Um, it tended often to be very technical in focus about whether they had proper computer equipment, whether they had a modem, how fast the modem was. Um, and this sort of describes the first 10 years of research on the internet. Um, it's still a major topic of interest among OECD countries, anywhere from 10 to 35 percent of the population is still not on the internet on any regular basis. But by the early 2000s, uh, researchers realized that access alone was not sufficient. Um, and the question came, how do people use the internet? Um, how, what is needed so that people are able to make effective use of the internet? Um, and that came out of the realization that some people were a lot better than others. Some people could use it much more effectively. Um, so the question of use dominated. Um, so it's no longer haves and have-nots, but the ways in which people use the internet. And that started to work. The work there were focused on things like the skills required to benefit from the internet and to exploit the benefits of the internet. And this sort of research goes under the name of the second digital divide, um, the participation gap, or the usage gap, among other things. Um, then, what I'm going to talk about tonight is a third issue, which is cultural attitudes toward the internet and toward technology, cultural values. The effect of culture is that culture orients people to new things. It helps them understand and interpret what they experience. The internet is full of new things. It's full of new websites and new activities. To use it effectively requires a willingness to explore. At a very basic level, do people care enough to try something new, uh, to pay the cost of learning something new so that they'll reap the benefits somewhere down the road? Um, so there's a major impact here um, simply based on openness to explore new things to go to new websites, to try new applications. This influences how productively people can use the internet um, to enhance their life chances and their social and political participation. So in this way, cultural values can either promote or they can hinder people's use of the internet. Now, 
Um, when we start talking about culture, of course, culture is notoriously complicated, slippery, and hard to define. Um, so my definition of culture emphasizes the relationship between culture and meaning. It's from Raymond, Raymond Williams, and he says, uh, culture is a description of a particular way of life which expresses certain meanings and values in institutions and ordinary behavior. So uh, the idea here um, that Williams is talking about, he calls this the social definition of culture. Um, and from this perspective, um, in order to make sense of cultural objects, um, like the internet, people have to attribute meanings to them. The meanings are not inherent in the object, rather they are constructed or they're produced through cultural practice, through behavior. Um, this emphasizes the role of practice. In other words, we construct meaning by what we do on the internet. Concrete practices generate how we think about an object, which is to say about its meanings. So as we do things on the internet and we attempt to describe our actions, we use words and images that form concepts that refer to various aspects of the internet, thereby constructing meaning. Now, this definition has, among other things, some very interesting methodological implications because it offers a methodological approach to cultures of the internet. We can look at the words people use to describe what they do on the internet to infer the meanings that, they, that the internet has for them. And I'll return to this point in the methodology section below. In a complex post-industrial society like Britain, um, objects rarely have one meaning. Um, instead, meanings are varied, and they vary systematically from one group to another. Um, and that should tell you immediately that my professional background is as a sociologist, because I believe in groups um, and different meanings across groups. Um, so my goal is twofold here. First is to understand the cultural meanings that the internet has for different groups. And second, to relate those meanings to actual practices on the internet. So with this understanding of culture and where we're going, I'm going to talk about historical evolution, evolving concepts of cultures of the internet. Um, the internet has been seen as a source of meaning for a long time. It's been, the meanings have been carried by various groups. Um, hackers, for example, um, this was a term used originally to characterize intensely engaged programmers. The sheer involvement in programming computers was an intense source of pleasure. There was particular development in this in places like MIT, and there's an early emphasis on this from the writings of people like um, Weizenbaum and Levy and so on. The hacking culture emphasized openness, sharing, decentralization, open access to computers. Now much later, of course, it has acquired a negative aspect of breaking into computers, but that was certainly not the original meaning. Now in early years, users had to do a lot themselves. There were not a lot of things available for them. So a culture of hobbyists grew up that tra who traded parts, designs, information on DIY computers, information on early software, working with software, and working through the problems here. Um, most famously, this was the uh, homebrew computer club in Silicon Valley between 1975 and 1985. Uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak were both members of that club uh, before they founded Apple. With the development of the early internet, there were online communities that developed, like the Well in San Francisco. Um, these were unusual because these were people who never met face to face. Participation in these communities was called homesteading uh, by Howard Reingold in his Virtual Communities book. Um, and the culture of these communities emphasized sharing and communication. Culture was also related to the social conditions brought about by computing and mediated by the internet. And this has been described as cyber culture or digital culture. These are somewhat vague concepts. They're certainly vaguer than the ideas of um, virtual homesteading or uh, hackers. Um, but they're related to the feeling that the online world is special and somehow different from the offline world. 
that it's a world all to itself, and it has its own unique, diverse set of meanings. Um, I'm not going to go into the wide variety of meanings that have been attached to cyber culture here, but simply note that in general, all of the meanings uh, tend to have values of openness, um, not paying for content, several things like that. Finally, as masses of people began to use the internet, people who'd grown up with access to online and digital culture were seen sometimes as unusual and better able to adapt to online culture than people who had to learn it as adults. These were the so-called digital natives. They're primarily young people. Um, and they're supposedly more at home in the virtual world compared to people who are not native to the digital environment. Um, one may question that, but nonetheless, it's widely held. So I'm going to, with that as sort of the background of the various ways that internet cultures have been considered, I'm going to start talking about data. Um, I'm going to be talking about data from the Oxford <coughs> Internet Surveys. These are random samples of the British population, um, England, Scotland, and Wales. There are six waves of them from 2003 to 2013. Each wave is about 2,000 respondents, age 14 or older. Um, um, the information is gathered in face-to-face -face interviews um, of about 45 minutes, so there are hundreds of uh, variables here to play with. Um, this, uh, what we're going to do here is we're not going to take cultures for granted. Instead, the working hypothesis is that there's great diversity in the internet population. Since this is severely under-theorized, we're going to take an empirical approach to identifying cultures. Is there, in other words, a coherent set of attitudes and beliefs about the internet? Um, there were 14 items in 2013 uh, in OXIS that focused on attitudes and beliefs about the internet. Four of them are here as examples to you. Um, these you see are all uh, five category, uh, the technical word is Likert scales for them. Um, you can see the first one, going online allows me to keep in touch with people. And the choices range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. The internet helps me save time. I waste too much time online. When I'm online, I don't feel lonely. And similar questions like that. Um, we took these 14 items, did a principal components analysis on the items, um, and these yielded four factors. Um, four components, uh, which represent the extent to which the respondents believe in particular, uh, that the internet led them to particular things. Um, first component was something we named enjoyable escape. This was marked by um, people who said that uh, the internet helped them pass time, that the internet was an enjoyable escape, that when they're on the internet they don't feel lonely, <laughs> and they enjoy being on time. Um, the second component was one we call instrumental efficiency. These were people who answered uh, that they strongly agreed with the uh, question, the internet made them more efficient, the internet made their life easier, the internet helped them save time. The fourth component was, third component was social facilitator. These were people who agreed with the items um, the internet helps people find out the information about me. The internet helps me keep in touch. The internet makes it easier for me to meet people. And finally, there was a negative set of items about the internet as a problem generator. That um, there's too much personal information online. The internet, I find the internet frustrating. The internet contains a lot of immoral material. And the internet takes too much time. Um, so these were the four components. Using these dimensions of attitudes, um, we did a cluster analysis that grouped respondents into five clusters that uh, formed a good fit and provided intuitively meaningful um, interpretations. Um, these clusters here um, come out as five separate cultures of the internet. Um, and we named them according to the dimensions on which they're um, according to the dimensions on which people uh, score very highly here. So there are the immersives, the techno-pragmatists, the cyber-savvy, the cyber-moderates, 
and the A Digitals. I'd be happy to listen to alternative names if any of you have them in mind. Um, I'm going to talk about each one of them in turn here. Um, so what we have here is the results of the cluster analysis here. Um, and the shaded area represents uh, groups of people where there are more than 50% of the people um, said yes to this particular uh, component. Um, so to start with, the immersives here. Um, they're above average here on three dimensions. 99% of them say the internet's an enjoyable escape. 88% say uh, the internet uh, helps them be efficient instrumentally. And 79% say it's a social facilitator. None say it's a problem generator for them. Um, so these are people who've clearly mastered the internet. The internet is working for them in all kinds of ways. Um, and the internet's under their control. It's 12% uh, of the British population um, are fall into this group. And I would expect most of you here um, in this room are probably immersives in one, mostly. Um, the second group were techno-pragmatists. These are people um, who have a largely pragmatic view of the internet. It helps them be efficient. It's a social facilitator here. Um, but they do not see the internet as a source of entertainment. Um, it's not fun. Okay? It's a technical tool for them. But the internet is still under their control. They're doing OK. It's 17% of the British population um, fall into this category. The third category are the cyber savvy. Um, they see both the positive and the negative aspects of the internet. And we call them cyber, and we call them savvy or streetwise because they see both benefits and dan dangers on the internet. So the internet for them is an escape. It's a source of efficiency, a source of social life, but it's also a source of problems. Um, they recognize the risks of being on the internet. And they're about 19% of the British population. This brings us to the two groups that are in many respects the most interesting groups here, the cyber moderates. Um, these people use the internet, but they're not really very engaged with it. They're not above average on any one of these four factors. <coughs> So they're not particularly taken by the benefits of the internet, and they don't really worry all that much about the dangers of the internet either. Um, they're a bit reluctant, perhaps, to be online. You might detect that in their responses here. The internet is probably not really under their control. They're notable because they're the largest group here. 37% of the British population is cyber moderates. Finally, we come to the eight digitals. Um, they're online, but they're not happy about it. Um, they don't see the internet as an escape. They don't see it as a source of efficiency, and it doesn't really help with their social life either. It's mostly a problem down there for them. That's what dominates them. Clearly, they see the negative aspects of the internet. The internet is out of their control. And they're about 14% of the British population. So we can summarize here by comparing sizes, which is quite interesting. Um, you notice that uh, the two groups on the ends, the immersives and the a-digitals, are about the same size. Um, but uh, more interestingly, perhaps, is if you look at cyber moderates and a-digitals, these are the people who are not really very enthusiastic. Combined, they're over 50% of the British population. This has significant implications for use of the internet and for various digital agendas. Um, both groups are fairly blah about the internet, and I'm going to come back to this point again several times. So the question then is, um, are these culturally similar groups simply surrogates? I'm calling them culture, but they might just be surrogates for demographic factors. You know, this could be differences in age or differences in education or something like that. So to answer that question, um, we did uh, a logistic regression, and that's the handout here, because it doesn't really fit on a um, PowerPoint slide very well. Um, so um, this, this is called technically a multinomial logistic regression. If you look on the front page here, um, it's a listing of the variables that are in the regression. Um, start out, to start out 
with, there are six variables that are basic demographic factors. <coughs> Age, um, ACORN code, which is basically a um, uh, measure of lifestyle. Um, then gender, uh, life stage, um, which is a four category variable. It's basically employment. It's um, students um, employed, retired, unemployed. Um, I think are the four categories. Um, income, a uh, three category income variable. And education, a uh, four category education variable. Then there are three variables uh, that measure skills and learning. Um, bad experiences, just, the, just a count of bad experiences reported on the internet. Skills, which is an internet um, skill index, a self-rated skills, and an openness to learning. Openness to learning new things and new skills. Finally, there are two variables that measure internet activity. One is whether the respondent uses social network sites or not. And the second is a measure of total um, internet activity. Um, so with those in mind for these variables, um, if you look on the back page here, these are part of the hierarchical regression results. Um, and I want to start about, there were, it's a hierarchical regression. There are three regressions here. Um, I've omitted the demographic variables because it gets really complicated and it's impossible to put on a single page if you add those. Um, but the important thing is down at the bottom there in that demographic column. If you look at that, um, you notice um, we have an R squared of 0 0.06 there. It's a measure of how well we're doing explaining um, our dependent variable. And we have something called a Bayesian information criteria of 4,900. Now, the 0 0.06 says we can explain about 6% of the variance in the dependent variable here with the demographic characteristics. So we're not doing very well with demography um, here. Um, and that, I think, is the main thing to think about. That's what this slide says. That says um, you know, the uh, cultures are not surrogates for demographic groups. If they were, we'd get a lot higher. Um, we'd get much, more, much better explanation here. So let's look at the second category, which is the skills and learning variables. Um, those are three skills and learning variables, bad experiences, skills, and openness to learning. Now these are odds ratios, and let me just briefly remind you how to interpret them here. Um, they're, um, the, let's just take that first in the upper left-hand corner of the skills column, which is the first statistically significant variable under skills and learning. 1.93, um, that's the comparison group here is to the A-digitals. And this says if you go one unit higher on the skill scale, it's a scale from one to five, you're almost twice as likely to be in the immer immersive group as you are to be an A-digital. So um, if you have additional skills, you're much more likely to be immersed than you are to be A-digital. Um, almost twice as likely for every one unit jump you go up. And similarly, if you look down to the second set of results here with the techno-pragmatists, you see the skills are 1.79. That's, again, almost twice as likely um, to be a techno-pragmatist than be an A-digital um, if you go one unit, if you're one unit more in the skills variable. You notice the skills are not statistically significant for either cyber savvy or the cyber moderates, which says that skills don't make you more likely to be cyber savvy or, and they don't make you more likely to be cyber moderate compared to the individuals. So the important point here is that um, skills are statistically significant and they have, they are more likely, more skilled people are more likely to be immersed or techno pragmatists and it doesn't matter for the cyber savvy or cyber moderates. Similarly, if you look at openness to learning, well, if you look, let's just look at the summary here. Um, remember, our theory is that people draw meaning based on experiences. Um, so um, if you look at the bad experiences, they are significant and positive only for the cyber savvy. Um, and uh, that's the third category down there. Um, Otherwise, bad experiences don't seem to matter. 
Um, that fits broadly because neither the immersed or the techno-pragmatists have any sense that bad experiences uh, have any impact on them. Remember, they don't care about, they don't see any risks. They're very positive about the internet. Um, and neither do cyber moderates. Um, skills are significant and positive only for techno-pragmatists and immersed. Willingness to learn is also significant and positive for techno-pragmatists and immersed. Um, so clearly, openness to learning makes you much more likely to be immersed. Openness to learning makes you more likely to be um, a techno-pragmatist. Um, and it does matter also for cyber-savvy learners, but not at all for the cyber moderates. Um, so the point here, if you look down at the bottom at the summary statistics, you notice that the McFadden's R squared jumps from 0 0.06 to 0.125, um, which uh, is saying that uh, the explained variance in our model almost more than doubles when we add these three um, skills and learning variables. Um, what that's saying is that experiences are more important than demographics for internet use. Um, this brings us then to our third um, set of results here, which is adding the internet activity variables here. Those are using social network sites and the amount of internet activity. Um, here again, using social network sites is significant and positive for everyone except the pragmatists, the techno-pragmatists. You remember the techno-pragmatists are people who don't have fun on the internet. So the fact that they don't use social network sites is probably something we would expect. Um, the amount of internet activity is significant and positive for the immersed and for the techno-pragmatists, again, reflecting their um, commitment to um, uh, the internet itself. Um, their much more intensive involvement. And McFadden's R squared adds almost four percentage points to that, um, going up to 16.4%. Um, big drops here, as you can see, and I won't bother to interpret that any further but it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. The point here of all of this is um, the online activity plays an important role in shaping the cultural meaning of the internet. That's the point of this. Because we can predict what category you're in depending on how you use the internet. Um, that's the key issue here. So this brings us to the issues of um, what this means. Clearly, there are differences in the meaning of the internet across different groups. And in fact, um, these differences stratify the internet according to cultural values. These values are related to how people interact with the internet. And the important point is cultural values are more important than demographics, like age and education and income. Um, and basically, the rest of this presentation is going to explore that issue, is what does this mean that cultural values are so important uh, when you think about internet activity. So let's start out just by looking on a very simple level of what, it, what this means um, if you have internet cultures. Um, we're looking here, the vertical axis is the percent of users who claim to do a particular activity more than ever. The horizontal axis is five, six categories of content production, um, posting photos on the internet, visiting social network sites, writing a blog, posting videos, posting creative work, and owning a personal website. Um, if you look at this, uh, the first thing you notice is, of course, the immersed do more of everything than anybody else. In every category, the immersed is the tallest uh, bar. So they do almost 90% of them post photos on the internet more than any other group. 26% of them own a personal website more than any other group. On the other, on the other side, if you look at the A-Digitals, they do less of everything than any other group, which is exactly what you would expect, um, because they don't really want to be on the internet to begin with. So why should they spend time producing content for the internet? Um, so there's not much there. Um, the cyber moderates here, are second to last on each group. They're just slightly above the A-digitals here. 
The techno-pragmatists actually are quite interesting here. Remember, they're the people who use the internet as an instrumental tool, um, not for any entertainment activity. And they um, are sometimes, for example, things like writing blogs, posting videos, they're below the cyber savvy here, um, posting creative work and owning a personal website. So in general, what you're seeing here um, is uh, the implications of these cultures of the internet for people's participation in this particular area of the internet, which is content production and the kinds of and various kinds of content production on the internet. On the point of classification, you're not including social media pages on this, and that's and that would confuse me because people would probably see it as a personal website and a blog uh, and a way of posting videos and, and pictures, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, um, the social network sites. Um, is social media, because this would be defined as Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, um, Google+, Plus, um, Pinterest, and so on. Um, all that again, visiting isn't the same as creating, is it? That's correct, absolutely. Now, there's a question about whether people think a Facebook page as a personal website. In general, okay. most people don't, is my feeling. Probably people don't know what a personal website is anymore, because they're not. Many don't, and you can see there, <laughs> <that> only about 20% <laughs> only about of the population would say they have one. If you look for the average of all those um, there. Right, and a lot of people don't know what a personal website is. They just have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page. And, um, so, yeah, um, right. Um, so, um, there, are several, there are a number of, so this says, so the cultures matter here in terms of production. Um, there are a number of interesting policy implications of this. Um, to begin with, over half of the British population is unenthusiastic about the internet, um, or possibly even hostile in the case of the individuals. And that suggests that programs that uh, the British government has that are attempting to get more people online, to get people to use the internet, face a major challenge. Um, these people, the um, these various sorts of groups here, uh, the A-Digitals and the Cyber Moderates, um, they're not going to explore new websites um, on their own, and they're not going to do new things like pay government fees just because the government thinks it's a good idea. Um, they're probably not going to go out and explore very much. Um, so getting people online, which is a major British focus, is probably not enough. There is a challenge that not only do people have to be able to go online, they need to know how to effectively use the internet. Um, and that may be harder than it's commonly assumed because half the British population doesn't really like to be online even if they are there. Um, so second, um, the focus of many current digital inclusion programs is providing skills training under the assumption that if we give people skills, then they'll go out and use the internet more. Um, this suggests um, possibly not. Um, for many people, skills may be an outcome of a particular set of cultural values. Um, they're not, a, they're a dependent variable rather than an independent variable. Um, and particularly, of course, they may depend on willingness to learn. Um, so improving skills may not lead to more online participation <laughs> if people do not value um, online activity and are not open to new experiences. Um, so in fact, participation in skills training is itself almost certainly linked to openness to learning and willingness to learn new things. So the culture's issue here raises several general issues about cultures of the internet. At its broadest level, um, these cultures that I've identified are differentiated by their sense of control over the internet. Two of the cultures, the immersives and the techno-pragmatists, feel that the internet is under their control, that they know what they're doing there. Three other cultures differ in the degree to which they believe the internet um, can serve their personal needs and interests. They see their control to be limited in ways that put them more or less at risk such as with respect to their privacy. At the extreme, the A-Digitals seem to suggest that the internet is out of their control. They feel excluded um, even if they are online. 
Now, in some respects, the cyber moderates are the most interesting culture. In the first place, they're the biggest culture. Um, and despite that fact, they're not very often discussed. Most of the discussion around the internet is based on people who really like the internet and are enthusiastic and are willing to talk about it, or people who really resist the whole idea of the internet. Um, groups like the moderates are really not often heard. Uh, people who don't really care. Um, so they underscore the extent to which um, a large proportion of internet users, at least in Britain, do not fit the stereotypes of either enthusiasts or opponents. Um, and uh, these are people, remember, who don't see major payoffs from being part of the internet. They don't see many benefits. Now, they don't see many risks either. Um, but they really have found a sort of middle way of being online as part of everyday life, but without much fervor or much, much interest. Given their tempered views of the internet, um, they are unlikely to be pressing the frontiers of internet use or exploring new applications. The next big thing is not their thing. They don't really care. Um, so for example, they're probably not very happy about government plans to go to uh, services to be digital by default are available only in digital form. Uh, this brings me to my third point, which is these cultures expose a great deal of diversity among internet users. There's a very wide spectrum of beliefs about the value of the internet and also its risks. These are not just differences in degree, they're also differences in kind. They're qualitative differences. And many theories of the internet tend to be less than clear about how different groups interact with the internet. Many digital inclusion theories simply assume everyone responds similarly to the same sort of stimuli. Um, and they don't distinguish between different categories of users. One of the points here is that how people respond to the internet depends a, to an important degree on the value that they put on the internet. And this needs to be taken into account in theorizing about the internet. Um, a couple of directions here for further research. Um, we're not totally happy with the names, so if you have suggestions, I would be delighted to hear them. Um, second, we would like to do get cross-national data for comparative purposes here, see if this works in other countries in addition to Britain. The problem is, of course, you need diverse attitude measures in order to get those sort of data, and those often don't exist other, in other countries. Uh, we would like to compare over time to earlier waves of the OXIS survey, and we've not done that yet. Finally, this really needs some qualitative work to examine representatives of the different types of internet users, the different cultures of internet users, and their characteristics in a great deal more detail. Um, we presented this to students, and um, their reaction was wild enthusiasm. One of them was so enthusiastic, uh, she created a meme for us here about being immersed in the uh, 2013 uh, OXIS study. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, there's more detail on our website. Um, in fact, uh, so I'm open to questions. Two years ago, it may have not been a, a relevant question, but it would be interesting to, to extend this to the use of a smartphone um, uh, with respect to your, your categorization. It would be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our mobile use has really exploded, and uh, there are all kinds of interesting questions surrounding the relationship between mobile use um, and, uh, and internet use more broadly defined uh, for many people. Um, mobile devices become their um, their primary point of access to the internet, their access point of choice, and it would be extremely interesting. We do have ish questions about mobile use in here. We could ask them. We can look at them. Um, I have not, um, so I don't know exactly where mobile use fits. My personal guess is that mobile use will track um, these categories fairly clearly. I think the immersed pragmatists will probably be more likely to own smartphones um, than the individuals. Um, but that's a guess. I haven't looked at the actual data. Earlier 
Um, my personal guess is um, young people were already so hooked in to the internet even before smartphones. Um, this only makes it more hooked in. Um, whether it makes a difference to older people is not clear to me. And there is so, um, you know, what the smartphones have done have made the, have, it's made the internet more ubiquitous. So you can, you know, you can uh, be communicating with the internet while you're on your commute, on a bus, or on the train, um, or something like that. Or even walking down the street, I mean. And um, so you can do it anywhere. You can get access to entertainment um, anywhere, which is what many people use it for. Um, or you can be talking to someone um, on your mobile, um, possibly Skyping with them. Um, so smartphones have made everything more integrated, made the, integra the integration of the internet easier, particularly if what you want to do is entertainment, because they've made it possible to be entertained in lots of places where people would just have been sitting there before, like on the commutes and buses. So, um, other than that, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the, the question is what else is happening beyond communication here? Um, you know, we see the headline stories of people who um, walk into traffic and are hit by a car because they're spending, they're talking, they're looking down at their phone and they don't see that there's traffic around them. Or they walk into trees or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, I can see that given how intensively my daughter interacts with her cell phone. Um, but, um, you know, whether, um, how that's going to work itself out, I don't really know. Um, in the short term, certainly, smartphones have made everything much more integrated. Sure. Uh, how static are these groups? Do you have any evidence that some are growing and some are shrinking over time? And we are, don't. That's a good question. Are individual, do you have any evidence that individuals can, can move over time? You know, well, we don't have any direct evidence. We would love to do this study with uh, 2011 and 2009 data, and I think we can do that. We just haven't done it yet. And um, that's it. I'm sure individuals can move, and certainly some do. I mean, anecdotally, I know people who have. Um, uh, to what extent they move, and um, whether there's anything really going on here in terms of the um, uh, whether there are large movements of people where you, that you could detect statistically, I don't know. Uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. It's actually a really similar question. I was wondering if there'd been, uh, if I understood correctly, most of what we've seen this evening has been based on the most recent iteration of the study. Mm -hmm. Are there any broad findings around how the groups have actually evolved into the five cultures that we see in those findings over time? Right. Yeah, and we don't have any overtime data at all. Um, that would, I mean, we can do it, but again, it would be very interesting to do, but we haven't done that yet. It would be extremely interesting to do, quite frankly, um, for all the reasons that you suggest here, that um, the questions of how these, whether these groups are growing or shrinking, or what's happening. Yeah? Um, I wondered whether you've done Kinds, 
Yeah, that's yeah. entirely possible. I mean, as you know, the work on this shows that, well, you know, the average number of person, the average person has four or five friends, there are yeah. close friends, there are people who have eight or nine yeah. close friends, and they work really hard at keeping these friendships. Yeah. And their pe the variance is quite large in terms of uh, the ways in which people maintain, the extent to which people maintain personal relationships. Um, so I don't really know. My personal guess is this social facilitation thing here, I walk back to it. Um, let's see, there's what I'm looking for. Um, these people, in the social, people who score highly and high in social facilitation, um, one sort of default issue is that um, if you assume that the online world and the offline, if you look at something online, your default the hypothesis should be that the online world is exactly the same as the offline world. And so I would guess these are people who tend to be more social um, and on, offline as well as online. It's not, there won't be that distinction of some people being uh, social offline but not online and vice versa. Um, so, but that's a guess. I don't have any direct evidence on that. Um, that would be very, would be another interesting hypothesis. Well, there's some fascinating questions here, but I'm not sure if this methodology is very good for answering them. Mm -hmm. We're in such a fascinating scene. A lot of the questions look out of date already after only two years. Mm -hmm. well, although the one conclusion I think that does stand out and is probably robust is that people aren't as enthusiastic about the internet as, as the government <laughs> and the hyperbole would suggest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, one of your sponsors for this is Ofcom, That's right. whose whole agenda uh, is the internet now, even moving broadcast television onto the internet. That's right. Uh, but what's their reaction to that? Do you have any feel? Um, well, they, we present them, we present these results to them. Um, they, uh, their, they do their own surveys. Um, and their surveys, they don't, the problem is they tend to be very technical. And they don't ask these attitude questions like we have here. Um, and uh, so these are new data for them. Um, they tend to be, uh, and they tend to be open to the idea, but they're not quite sure what to do with it. I mean, so, um, you know, their, their remit is technical. Um, it's more like the Department of Culture, Media, and Sport that's supposed to get people online because it's supposed to improve British productivity. Um, I mean, I can trace that if you're interested in exactly what's going on there. But um, the bottom line is that um, DCMS is trying to, has a remit to, um, to get more people online because British productivity is lagging. And the government thinks that the higher, better, internet, more internet use will improve productivity faster. Well, there's no evidence at all for that, is there? There's no evidence that computers have improved productivity. In well, I, yeah, I, I mean, this is certainly a debated point. You're absolutely right about that. Um, Britain's internet sector is the largest, one of the largest in the world. It's larger than the US as a proportion of GDP. Um, and um, it's growing faster than China's as a proportion of GDP. Um, so that has been part of the uh, part of the impetus is that realization that the internet is really, really important to Britain. Um, and so, you know, why not build on our strengths here? Um, which is to say that we're real well connected, uh, better than anybody else. And so, just keep getting us, keeping us connected, <laughs> even better. Um, yeah, as far as the methodology is concerned, yeah, I mean, it's a cross-section, and it's a set of, you know, principal components analysis built on a cluster analysis, and on top of that, it's a regression model, yeah. and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a long stack. Just file that. Yeah. Um, I can defend it piece by piece, um, you know, as these, each of the steps is reasonable, um, and I think the bottom line in the, the tables you have there, that, which is the regression results, is probably pretty robust. Now, whether in detail it would be robust, it's hard to say. I say it's robust because it matches other results we've gotten. I mean, if you look at simply um, attitudes toward technology, um, and you, you're, if you have a dependent variable that's something like, how much do people use the internet? How many different things do they do on the internet? Um, are they on the internet or not? doesn't really matter what dependent variable you have uh, that measures something about internet use. 
attitudes toward technology are always really strong. Um, it's a really strong predictor. Um, so this was not totally surprising to see these kind of results um, here. Um, and um, this, is based, this is an extension of this because we're much more sophisticated than just a single attitude scale here um, in this research. So, um, so there's, there's, there's other evidence that says this matters. The, the underlying, the problem in one sense is um, the rest of the research field is not doing this. So nobody else is worrying about attitudes toward the internet. They're still back on um, demographic issues and so on. And that's the point of this paper, is to help move people away from demographics a little further and get them into uh, thinking more about values and attitudes and the cultural issues surrounding um, why people use the internet. And psychometrics, maybe next? Pardon, sir? And, and psychometric analysis, maybe next? Is the next? That's a good question. Um, we don't have any measures here of psychology, not even the sort of big five um, uh, parts. Of, and so this is an issue. Um, so I don't know. I mean, in one sense, some of this stuff is some of this stuff is psychological. And if you look back at these questions, you can argue these that some of these things are are you know you're wasting too much time online, or you don't feel lonely when you're online. I mean, they tap into certain psychological states, um, but we're calling them um, cultural because of this, as out of our definition there earlier that uh, says that the um, that culture is uh, behavior and uh, people expressing meanings and values in behavior. Um, and so it's in a sense it's we're saying you want to look at how people act or at least how they report that they act um, on the internet. Yeah. With an increase in into <coughs> doing things online uh, rather the old fashioned way by going to an office or getting involved. Mm -hmm. uh, but increasingly, it isn't that it's no longer a choice. There's some things you can only do online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, buying this particular social security benefit. So. Right. Um, now, the response to that is, well, yes, it's obviously the more efficient and more sensible and lots of advantages. Um, so we must roll out the internet more and give many more people access. Mm -hmm. And as you see, that's probably not going to solve the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so is it then a question of, well, we've got to train them a bit more. Mm -hmm. Now, what you've done, and it's not clear that will do it either. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? That's an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting question, right. Uh -huh. Because the way I presented this, it suggests like it matters what people's attitudes are and how do you change an attitude. I mean, how do you explain, let someone explain to you that, you know, how do you say, get someone to say that they, they no longer feel lonely when they're online or something like that. Um, and I think that's, that's, I think that's very hard. Um, I think the, um, um, part of the answer is, um, you have to ask people what it is they want and find things that they want online. So if someone is interested, I mean, people get online not because they want to go online, but because, you know, they want to talk to their grandchildren and their grandchildren will talk to them on Skype. Um, or because they, um, you know, they like fishing or foot, they're part of a football club and the football club puts all of its statistics up online and they're no longer available any other way. Um, and so, uh, or because you can get something, something that they can't get otherwise online, that they have to go online to get, and they like it, and they want to get it. Um, so I think the problem is finding ways of, of hooking into these sorts of things that people really like doing, and showing them that they can do this online, and do it better. And then they start to see the benefits of being online. That's the carrot approach. That's the carrot approach. What I'm seeing, and it's not as well here, is that commercially, 
people being penalised for using it. Yes. Um, you know, we, we've let this idea go in access for maybe the last two, three years. And British Gas have been penalised people for not, not operating in line. A lot of the utilities do now. Right. And, and I think it's, I'm not sure how I personally feel about it, but it's an issue to be considered. Yes, it is. Banks are commerce is stepping in there, they're driving the gender as well. Mm -hmm. you know, you've just spoken about the character, right? Which is nice. Commerce is stepping in with the stick. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people stepping in with the stick. I mean, you know, um, basically all, now all the job centers, you have to apply for jobs online. There's no way to do it except online. Now, and, uh, at least they make a possible attempt at making it accessible. That's right. Yeah, they try to say if you don't have access, you can come I here. I wouldn't and that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, you're absolutely right. Often things are cheaper online. You often get benefits from from your bank, from your utility, your electric utility, from um, phone companies, uh, from mobile well, services. I see the penalties. Yes. In your many cases. Your telephone bill is more expensive. Right. If you don't do this. Right. right. Yeah. You can measure the cost literally in pence and pounds. I'm not getting a benefit of doing this. Mm -hmm. the, the way it mm -hmm. seems to be pitched is that people are not being paid for this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the government would really, really, really like to move as much as possible online because it's so much cheaper. Um, but the problem is that too many people are not online. Mm. And particularly, the people who are not online tend to be concentrated among people who are older, who are poor, who are less well educated, who are disabled, so on. So these are actually the groups that receive, dis receive disproportionate numbers of government services. So the irony is, of course, that many government services are being delivered to populations which are disproportionately not online. So they can't, they can't really completely abandon the idea of um, phone and walk-in personal service. Who's the main consumer for your data? And who are you targeting at that out? Primarily, well, we do give we do give reports to sponsors, to Ofcom and non and Trust and so on. Um, these are primarily, it's primarily an academic purpose. So um, this is uh, trying to trace British internet activity um, as it changes and grows and so on. Because my personal experience, I mean, you know, it's only web pages and all kinds of IT providers. We still think of um, cultural groups rather than groupings as you presented now. Right. So that, that could be quite a big shift, actually, to mm -hmm. categorize our users in quite a different way. Right. Well, it like the last year we come to our work, mm -hmm. we, we categorized our typical users, cultural groups, and social and economic groups. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it would skew our, our view as, as technicians, mm -hmm. our view would be skewed by yeah, the challenge so. rather than skewed as a negative thing. It would change what we, we were trying to deliver. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're right. Um, I think many commercial and government organizations think of themselves as providing products and services for you know, women of a certain age or men of a certain age or teenagers or whatever it is. And, they're thinking very much in demographic categories mm -hmm. that way. Um, and this is, uh, this is quite a different approach. Um, this would say, this wouldn't necessarily negate those categories in terms of providing goods and services, but it might point to who is more likely to take advantage of those goods and services online as opposed to running them offline. Can you change the way you present? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The shape. 
Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to think about, is how you might measure that. Or do you feel people are more hostile online or offline? That's the question. A man just got life in prison this afternoon for his activities on match.com. Right. Um, so may that be a lesson to you all. Yes, right. <laughs> well, it's match.com in conjunction with other activities. <laughs> <laughs> right, match.com did not appreciate the publicity. <laughs> Well, I think we've uh, exhausted the questions, but I think we probably could carry on discussing this uh, all night. But uh, I just want to uh, ask everyone to thank you in the usual way. For very and if anyone's not signed the sign up sheets, uh, please, please do so. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs>